Welcome to First Baptist this morning. Glad you came to join us this chilly morning. Let me be the first one to say Merry Christmas. Glenn, I thought you were going to say it. It was like on the tip of your tongue and I was like, no, I want to tell them. <laughs> it's all right, right? It's after Thanksgiving. Some of us, I'm sure, have been itching to get in the Christmas spirit. Show of hands, who's had a Christmas tree up for more than a week? All right. Probably more of you just choosing not to participate, probably. That's fine. But I think it's official. Christmas is in full swing. And so here's just a few things that are going to happen between now and December 25th. In the next 24 days, Americans are projected to spend $980 billion. That's a large number. Almost a trillion dollars on Christmas. Over 115 Americans will travel over 50 miles to get to a Christmas gathering. On average, everyone in this room will attend at least five get-togethers for Christmas. The average household will hang up 1,650 lights in or on their home. Probably some of them are already there. I could tell you a story about my experience with that yesterday, but it's terrible and you don't want to hear it. <laughs> I'm certain that some of you have had the same experience. And now that's a lot less than Clark Griswold's 25,000 imported Italian twinkle lights, but it's a start, right? I saw some truly useless information when I was looking all this up. And one thing told me that if Clark would have turned his Christmas lights on for five hours a day, every day in December, his electric bill would have been $3,700. <laughs> and then I found out that I think it was trying to sell me LED lights because it said he could have done the same thing for $1,600 <laughs> with the LEDs. Americans, and I don't understand this one, will purchase and consume 15 million gallons of eggnog. So you all can have all of that. <laughs> They'll buy 1.7 million candy canes. We'll no doubt spend time decorating and baking and shopping online and shopping in stores and going to plays and going to concerts and special events and that's no doubt on top of your already busy life that I know is not going to slow down just because it's Christmas. And so today, December the 1st, even better a Sunday, the first day of the week, I just want to challenge you, it's a perfect time to slow down and take a breath. To make sure we don't rush through this season and miss the heart of it all. Because at the root of all the craziness, all the mess that we've made of Christmas is still the same as on that first Christmas night. The object of it all, of the angels, the shepherds, later the wise men, of Mary and Joseph, and I'm convinced even the animals in the stable, the single focal point of that first Christmas was Jesus. God in human form. And I want to spend some time on a familiar story this morning. It's in Matthew chapter 2, if you want to flip there, but it's the story of the wise men. The magi, as they're called. Before we get into that, though, I just want to say there's a few things that have kind of snuck in tradition about this story that's not actually in Scripture. And so first, how many wise men do we say there are? We always say three, right? That's not in Scripture. That probably snuck in tradition because there's three gifts, three wise men. Second, and don't throw anything at me here, but the wise men probably don't belong in the manger scene. I know that may be a shock, but we're going to read that they came from a long way away. And if that doesn't satisfy you, you're going to read that they entered a house, not a stable, to worship Jesus. And so probably after the census... All the people had gone home and there was room for Mary and Joseph in a family member's home. And that's probably where they were. And then at some point these wise men have been dubbed kings. And that's probably not true either. It's probably more likely that they're just what the scripture says. They're astrologers. 
And so you might be thinking, what difference does it make? And I kind of agree with this story that it doesn't remove any of the significance. It doesn't change the point of it. But I do think there's something about and some importance of conveying what the Scripture actually says, especially to our young people. Because we never want them to get older and come to a passage of Scripture that they're familiar with and read it and think, that's not the way that I was taught. And so I think the, the best example of that is probably Samson. We teach this Sunday school cartoon version of Samson, this strongman hero, and then you grow up and you read the adult version of Samson, or I guess I should say the biblical version. That guy's pretty messed up. That's not what the Bible says. And the truth about this story is it is so packed with meaning and so important that there's no reason to say it any other way than it's actually written. And so look, let's look at it together. Chapter 2 it starts in verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. So picture the backstory here. You've got these men from the east, likely from Babylon, maybe Persia, probably 500 plus miles away. These are men of status, they're men of knowledge, they're men of intelligence, they're men of wealth. They study the moon and the stars and the sun and the solar system. Don't think of them as like false prophets or diviners or magicians that you sometimes read about in the Bible. That's not what these men are. They're respectable men. But we've got to wonder, right, what would make these intelligent, wealthy men travel 500 plus miles in ancient times, no doubt? How would they have known that this star meant that a king was born? If they knew that, how would they know that this king would be king of the Jews? Why would a king of the Jews be interested to them anyway? Israel had been ruled by other nations for hundreds of years by this time. How could a king, even an infant king, have any significance for them? There's a couple thoughts on this. I think they're both probably likely in the right line of thinking. But one is that these, these wise men were from the same line the same fold as the wise men that Daniel and his friends were placed over in Babylon. And so we know that when Israel was taken over there into exile, likely some Old Testament scriptures would have gone over there with them. And there's the thought that some of these scriptures maybe remained there afterwards. And we know from history that even when Israel was allowed to go back, not everyone went back. Some of them stayed there. And so that's a a good thought on what they knew Another thought, and and I'm sure that this one has some truth to it, is that these men either came from the same line or at least had knowledge of the prophecy of Balaam. If you remember Balaam, if you remember that story from Numbers, Israel was coming out of Egypt. They were headed into the promised land. They defeated some nations already. And the Moabites were terrified that they were going to be taken over by Israel. And so the king of the Moabites sent over to the east to find a wise man who would come back and curse Israel, if you remember what that says. And so his men went over to find somebody, and they find this wise man in the east called Balaam, and they ask him to curse Israel. And he says, well, I'll think about it. And that night God comes to him, and he, and he says, you're going to give a word, but it's not going to be a curse. You're going to go and bless Israel. And so three different times, even though he was hired by the Moabite king, to curse Israel so that they might defeat him, he blesses them. And we see part of this blessing, the third one, in Numbers 24, 17. Listen of the significance of this scripture. It says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. And so it says a star will come out of Jacob and a scepter or a king will rise from Israel. This is too coincidental for me to believe that these wise men didn't at least have knowledge of this scripture. 
Not only was the prophecy of this king signaled by a rising star, which they saw, but it also prophesied that this king would crush nations in the world that had significance that they would have been interested in. What I really want you to see, though, is that they had no doubt what this star meant. I love the way they describe the star to Herod. They say, we saw his star. They didn't say, we saw a star. They didn't ask Herod and his wise men if they'd seen anything or if, or if they thought something of this. They said, we saw his star, and they saw it when it rose. Again, it's what they didn't say that means a lot. I feel like they didn't say that we looked up and all of a sudden it was there. They didn't say that it snuck past us, but we kept searching around and we finally found it. No, they said, and it sounds like, that they saw the star the first time it rose. That can only mean that they were looking for it. And don't miss the purpose of their visit. These rich, affluent, intelligent men came for worship. It was no ordinary visit. And again, this is a great reminder for us here on December 1st. Make sure we're looking for Jesus this Christmas. It's entirely possible to wake up after it's all over having missed it. Make sure to stop and look and take a breath and take time by yourself and with your family to slow everything down and enjoy the knowledge that God, the God of the universe literally and physically stepped into history for you and me, for our sake. Let's read on. It says, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. This is probably not quite a vivid enough translation for us. It means that he was terrified or closer to terrified than troubled. And so we know some history about Herod the Great, and at the end of his life, which he is here in this scripture, he became increasingly and increasingly paranoid, to the point where history tells us that he had his favorite wife and two of his children put to death because he thought they were plotting to get his throne. And so he's paranoid here, and he's thinking, how could anybody come here to worship something that's not me? And so he falls right in line with other world leaders of biblical times that, and he starts making decisions solely based on his paranoia and his insecurity and his power. Glad those days are over, right? And so he's terrified and it says all Jerusalem with him. Verse 4, And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for it, so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you've found him, Bring me word that I too may come and worship him. So I want to step away from the story for a minute here just to talk about a, a truth that I read this weekend. God informs us through several different prophets of just about every detail of Jesus' birth. And none of these prophecies are general, and all of them came centuries before it happened. And so it's not prophecies like you would visit a fortune teller and they would tell you something and any one of a hundred things could make it happen. No, these are very specific. And he doesn't tell us the nation that Jesus is to be born in or the region of that nation or the smaller area. He tells us the exact town Jesus is to be born. And because God is perfectly sovereign over everything, that's what happens. Paul Tripp writes these words about these verses. He says, The specificity of God's promise about where the Messiah would be born is a picture of how infinitely confident God is in his own ability to do whatever he has said he will do, wherever he has said he will do it, and whenever he knows the time is right. You can bank on and build your life on the promises of God. 
But the wise men no doubt had the place in a stir. Their entrance would have been noted. It says that it was noted by all of Jerusalem. You'd only had to look at their entourage and their dress and all the valuables that they brought with them to know that something big was going on here. We don't know how many there were. Tradition says three, but Scripture leaves room for several. And I love how Herod the Great, who is a godless, crazy tyrant, even he knows this is a big deal. And so he calls together the chief priests and the teachers. This would be the Sanhedrin that we read about later in Jesus' ministry. He calls them together. Ironically, the very people who should have been looking for the Messiah to come. And so he asked the Sanhedrin, where is the Christ to be born? Now that's an important question because now we know we're not just talking about a political king. We're talking about something much more. And Herod is the one who recognizes it. We're talking about something much greater. We're talking about the Israelite expectation of a deliverer. We're talking about the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ, as Herod has said. And look at all the things that are happening here at once. These respected men have traveled a long way. They've come not saying they're just looking for a king, but they're wanting to worship a king. They've seen a star rise from the east over Israel. Herod calls them all together, and he starts asking them about their Messiah. Shouldn't some bells start going off in their heads? Like, they know the prophecies. All these things are coming together. Shouldn't something start stirring in their minds? What's so interesting here is that the leaders quote two different scriptures. They quote Micah 5.2, but then they add in a a verse from 2 Samuel. He says, Micah 5.2, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler." But then they splice in this part that says, Who will be a shepherd over my people Israel? That's from 2 Samuel 5.2. That's where David is anointed king over Israel. The signs of a fulfilled prophecy are literally all over this situation. And then what's worse, Bethlehem is only five miles south of Jerusalem. And so you've got the wise men who have traveled 500 plus miles to see this king, to worship him, this king that they're certain that was born. And then you have the teachers of the law and the prophets that pointed to this king who didn't even bother to travel the five miles to see if they were right. When you put this all together, you really can't help but read verses 5 and 6 just with indifference from the Jewish leaders. It's literally like they're saying, yeah, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. That's what the prophet Micah said, but hey, it's not Isaiah or Jeremiah, one of the big ones. And when you find this little king, you know, make sure he's from the line of David and cue up the Sanhedrin laughing in the background. And I can't help but read it that way because this, sadly, is the last mention of God's people in this narrative. They don't investigate the situation. They don't follow the wise men. They don't give it a second thought. They just have this cold, arrogant knowledge of Scripture void of any sensitivity of the work of the Holy Spirit going on around them. And the point of Matthew's entire gospel, don't be like them. Jews, you missed it. Look at verse 122 in the book of Matthew. It's the first of 12 times he writes these words. He says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. This is the key verse, the theme of the book of Matthew. He writes his gospel to the Jews and over and over again he points to these significant milestones and he says this happened because the law and the prophets said it would happen. Jesus is your Messiah. 
12 times he writes, look at Jesus. This happened to him. They said it would happen. He's the Messiah. But all we see from religious Israel is complete and utter indifference. Don't be like them. The wise men came to worship Christ and they were met with indifference from the religious and hostility from the worldly king. I think that translates pretty well to today. But I also think this message is just as true as us and it's the same moment from the same warning from a moment ago. Don't be like them. Don't miss it. Don't let your knowledge of the Christmas story grow cold and indifferent. Be reverent. Stay in awe of the coming king. Don't let the hostility and the commercialization of Christmas allow you to miss him. So Herod gathers the timing of the star. That foreshadows one of the most evil things anyone has ever committed. But verse 9 says, After listening to the king, they went on their way. Behold, the star that they'd seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. I just picture these men after they're leaving Herod and they're headed down toward Bethlehem and I picture it about dusk and and I just think about them being excited that night is coming. Just waiting on it. They're fixed on the sky. Hoping, maybe even praying that this star that they saw in the east would come out one more time so that they could travel this short distance and reach where they were going. And once again, they saw it as it rose. I love that scripture tells us that. And they watch it until it comes to rest in a way that somehow they know exactly where this little king is. And it says they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. If that doesn't resonate with you, what it means is they could barely contain themselves. That tells me a few things. First, I believe that all good science points to faith, but not all faith points back to science. What I mean by that is that God sometimes uses perfectly timed natural scientific events that can be explained as such for his purposes. But sometimes God enters time and space and shows his authority and superiority over those things in a way that can't be explained by science for his own purposes, for a specific reason. And I think for these wise men who have studied the stars for who, who knows how long, there's no doubt that they'd seen comets and meteors and planets that come in alignment that looks like a giant star. I personally don't believe that any of those things are what's happening here. I believe that God created or fashioned or spoke into existence this star for the purpose of showing these men where Jesus was and I think they knew it and they could barely contain themselves. I mean, think about that. Have you ever seen a star that rises into the sky and settles in some way where you know that the exact point that is over is a specific house? If you research it, you can find as many thoughts on it as people write them. But I think the best explanation is that this was supernatural and God is using it for his own purposes. And second, I have to believe because they've never seen a star like this before, they knew something was at work here. And I've got to believe that the closer that this entourage got to the one that they would call King of Kings and Lord of Lords and Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God and Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, God with us. You had to think that their expectation just got heavier and heavier the closer that they got. They probably went from barely being able to control their excitement to wondering what it's going to be like. 
What's he going to look like? What, who's going to be there? And as they get closer and closer, I imagine that excitement turn into reverence. And then awe. And then maybe even a little fear as they get close. Until it all climaxes with them getting to the place and walking in and falling down in worship. I love that there's no question about if they're in the right place. Who are we supposed to worship? Because when you come expecting to meet the king of the Jews, there is no doubt when you get in his presence. And the only right response is to fall down in worship. We should come to this place with a weighty expectation to meet Jesus. Did you know the Hebrew word for glory literally means weight? The weight of God. I believe these wise men, the closer and closer they got to Jesus, the heavier the glory of God was on them until they walked into that room. And it was so heavy that all they could do was fall down and worship. But I also don't think that this happens unless you have expectation in your heart. This word expectation, it's a word that God's been using to convict me lately. And so I'll just ask you what God has been asking me. What do you expect from God? What do you expect from God? That's likely what you'll get. What do you expect when you come in this place? That's likely what you'll find. I'm a firm believer that if we come in here with a weighty expectation that we're going to find and experience the glory of God every Sunday, that it won't matter what the place looks like, it won't matter what the music is or what the message is preached. If we come here with that type of expectation, we will find and worship the Savior 100% of the time. The grace notes won't only read the sanctuary is beautiful or the music was good or the message was on point. They'll read God was here today. The Holy Spirit moved today. I felt the weight of His presence this morning and I worshiped. I think the same thing can be said about what you're looking for and what you're expecting this Christmas. Don't miss the weight of what we're celebrating. I love the contrast that continues between these foreign Gentile wise men and who were supposed to be the spiritual leaders of Israel. Think about what they likely expected when they came and what they found. They they thought that a king was going to be born, and so naturally they came to the capital city, Jerusalem. But they found a crazy old man on the throne. They knew this king was the king of the Jews, a religious people, and so they came to the holy city. But they just found a cold indifference from the religious people there. Then they're directed to this poor village of Bethlehem. And no doubt, no big house there, but a small cottage. They come in and they find this king in the form of of an infant who is essentially under the care of two people who are homeless. But all of that proves what I just said. When you come expecting to meet Jesus, all the stumbling blocks of what's going on around you are removed. And you're able just to worship Him for who He is. Your Savior. Your King. Finally, the wise men opened their treasures and they offered Him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way the wise men came bearing gifts gold and frankincense and myrrh and the 
significance of these gifts can't be missed. Gold was the most precious metal. It was the gift to honor a king. Isaiah writes in chapter 60, this is about the future glory of Israel. Listen to these words. He says, Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. They shall bring gold and frankincense, and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. I think Matthew understood this scripture to be the backdrop of the scene of the wise men. He understood this gift to be a gift suited for a king. And again, the wise men, as they have gotten it right the whole time in this story, they get it right again. They didn't say they, come, they had come to worship a child who would one day be king. They said that they had come to worship a child who was already king. It says they brought frankincense. This was a, a resin from the east, and you could find the priest in uh, the Jewish community using this in sacrifices in the temple. And so people would bring grain offerings and the priest would add frankincense to the offerings and when they burnt it, it would smell good. There was a good aroma that came up. And Matthew understood to include this because it indicates the sacrifice that Jesus would make for us all. They brought gifts of myrrh. This was first mentioned in Exodus 30, 23, when God instructed Moses to take myrrh, which is a spice, and mix it with some other spices and then combine that with olive oil and to use that as an anointing oil. And so they anointed the tent of meeting and the instruments in the tent. And then they anointed Aaron and the priest with this oil. And so Matthew is saying Jesus is a priest of a different order. He's the ultimate high priest, anointed with this myrrh, one that would last forever. We see that the men were warned in a dream to stay away from Herod, and they went a different way home. Again, the contrast continues. The Sanhedrin wouldn't travel five miles to see if the king, if the Messiah had really been born, and the wise men travel who knows how far out of their way to make sure Herod's not alerted. To what's going on. And so Herod's plan to kill Jesus doesn't work. Think about that. From the very moment that the world knew Jesus was there. That he had entered. They began trying to kill him. They tried for thousands of years to wipe out the Jews. So they never got there. But it didn't work. Herod murders an entire generation of babies to get rid of him, but it didn't work. They thought they'd killed him on the cross, but God uses the same indifference and evil that we see in this story to accomplish the greatest gift that any man has ever been given. And Jesus still lives. And the world's been trying to kill him again ever since he rose from the grave. It didn't work then and it's not going to work now. But I think that the enemy knows that too. And so I think that he's changed his strategy. And I think that what the enemy will do this Christmas is not try to kill Jesus, but try to cover him up with green and red sparkles and wrapping paper and shiny gifts and pageants and plays and demanding as much of our time as we're willing to give until it's all gone. And we wake up on the 26th having missed it all. And don't get me wrong, you know those things aren't bad in themselves, but if they consume your Christmas, or if after it things like that, sparkly things consume your life, that's not the way you're supposed to live. There's so much we can learn from this account of the wise men coming and worshiping Jesus. First, we see that they were looking for the star. They saw it the first time that it rose. Be looking for Jesus this Christmas season. They were also very intentional in their response to all these things. These men committed to traveling what would have pretty much been halfway around the world at this point. They understood the significance of the season and they did everything they could to make sure they participated in it. it. 
Remember this too, we have this great ability when we read scripture to identify with whoever it is that makes us look better, right? And so we'd love to identify with the wise men who are always getting this right. But the truth of the matter is, we're the ones that are at risk of growing cold and indifferent about the Christmas story. We've heard it a thousand times. We can tell you all of them. Don't let that happen this Christmas. Instead, be like the wise men. Come into the Christmas season with expectation. The closer it gets, allow the weight of the glory of Christ to grow heavier and heavier until it causes you to fall down in worship. When you see his star rising this Christmas, allow it to reset your awe and your wonder. Allow it, you to, allow it to place you back in reverence that Jesus Christ, God himself, God's own son, stepped into history and every step that he took was in the direction of the cross so that he could give his life for you and me. If that doesn't reset your awe and your wonder and your excitement about Christ, I don't know what will. Learn to live the Christian life in season and out of season with expectation. Something I'm learning right along with you, but I'll be honest, the more that I learn it, the more important that I see it to be. Because your expectation of God affects whether or not you read Scripture. It affects what you get out of reading that Scripture. It affects whether or not you pray. And the effectiveness of your prayers depends on it. Let me put it this way. We talked about this in our men's Bible study. But a lot of times, all we expect from God is our salvation. Think about it. Is that all you expect? That sounds irreverent, I know, because our salvation is something that we don't deserve. It's the greatest gift that's ever given. We cannot understand the depth of it. We didn't earn it. It is purely grace. But if that's all God wanted for you, then why did he promise you so much more? He promises you love and guidance and protection and strength and comfort and rest, forgiveness. You can bank on and build your life on those promises. But do you expect that from Him? Learn to come to God in Scripture and in prayer with an expectation of experiencing the weight of God's glory and with an expectation of actually receiving those things that he's promised you if there's one thing I tell you to write down today not just for this Christmas but for your life going forward it's that live life expectantly just as the wise men intelligent reverent wealthy men came to the place where they were to meet Jesus barely able to contain themselves you come to the place where you meet Jesus barely able to contain yourself with a great weight of expectation come to the place where you meet Jesus with that same attitude come to scripture with that attitude Go into prayer with that attitude. Come to church with that attitude. Sing with that attitude. Respond to God with that attitude. See if that doesn't cause you to fall down and worship Him. Find a way this Christmas to allow the weight and the expectation of the glory of God to allow you to fall down and worship him. God, thank you so much for this morning. 
Lord, we thank you for the start of this great season that is so many of our favorites, Lord. Such a great time to, to be with family and to, to show our giving, Lord. And um, God, I pray that you would help us to do that in a way that still honors you. That doesn't consume us, that doesn't take up every last bit of our time. God, help us to come into this season with expectation, believing in your promises, understanding that the things that you said you'll actually do. Lord, help us to stop and take a breath and lead our families into worship of you this season. God, I know that if we will do that, you will be faithful to put on us your weight of glory. God, it's not a weight that's a burden. It's a weight that causes us to worship. Lord, I just pray again as we go into this season, Lord, it would be a time of reflection, a time of thankfulness for your son. God, that he not only came that he not only lived, but that he died for us, he gave his life for us, so that we could be with you. God, help us to be wise men and wise women. Lord, lead us into expectation and lead us into worship this season. In Jesus' name, amen. I just invite you as we sing, I'll be standing up here if um, you'd like to come and pray and But I just pray even right now, even when we sing this song, that you just allow the weight of the glory of God to cause you to worship. Respond to him however he's talking to you. Whether that's in your seat or up here if you need prayer. And I'll tell you this, if you've never felt that weight, that glory of the Lord, then you've never experienced Christmas as the way it's supposed to be. Experience that the first time this year. Give your life to him, the one that it's all about.